Good evening, and thank you for tuning in. Poke Tunes is the show where we analyze all the music of Pokemon. The tune for today is Pewter City. Before we begin, I want to talk about boss battles. Usually, boss battles occur at the end of grueling and repetitive dungeon sequences to test the player with one last challenge before they can progress to the next area. The scientists at the end of Mount Moon and Giovanni in the rocket hideout are kind of like this, but no one is going to argue that those battles are structure-defining, no. Pokemon puts its most iconic boss fights right in the center of town, next to the inn in the shop. I'm talking, of course, about the gym leaders. But is Pokemon the first RPG to do something like this? Saga, a series that Pokemon's developers admitted to taking some inspiration from, contained a fight against Genbu in the middle of town, activated by putting a set of armor on the statue. But that isn't a reoccurring idea throughout the game. Pokemon really is the first RPG I know that attempted this sort of boss-in-town structure. You see, Saga may have collectible monsters, team customization, nameable characters, and plenty of folklore and mythology references, but the story and structure of the game isn't relatable like Pokemon. And that extends to the music, too. You can't really tell the difference between Saga and Final Fantasy music. They're even written by the same guy. Pokemon music is different. Each town, route, and location gets unique music that sets the tone for the area, and illustrates the type of people and or Pokemon that inhabit it. The setting of Pokemon is modern, the monsters are cuter than they are menacing, and battling is more an act of trust and friendship between your Pokemon than a necessity to save the world. So the music in towns can be cute, and the roots can give off a feeling of wonder rather than, well, whatever this is. So let's take a look at the music to the lair of the first major boss in the entire series. Pewter City. Taking a look at section 1, we start in E major with an 8 measure antecedent phrase. We use the progression 1, 2, 5, 7 for the first musical gesture. By starting on a stable 1 chord and leading to a 5, 7 chord with a 2 chord, it leaves the musical question open. The second four-measure phrase has the progression 7 diminished, 5, 7, 1. Both 7 diminished and 5, 7 are dominant chords. Dominant chords contain notes that smoothly lead us back to the one chord. 5, 7 has an additional note in common with the one chord that 7 diminished doesn't have, making for an even smoother transition back to one. This is why 7 diminished is considered to be a weaker dominant chord than 5, 7. It makes sense to go from a 7 diminished to 5 7 because the additional common tone helps strengthen the resolution of the harmony. At the end of the consequent, which is the second A measure phrase, he cadences or ends on the one chord, giving that section a sense of closure. The second section has a 4 1 5 1 progression that is embellished with an additional 2 chord before the 5 chord. The phrase is then repeated, but instead of going to 2, it goes straight to 5-7. But then, Masuda introduces C natural, an additional note that wants to resolve to 1 in this case, making the arrival at the final cadence even stronger. Listen to all this counterpoint. There's so much going on here that it feels a bit overwhelming. When music is as dense with motion like this, it has a sedative effect. Brahms famously combined repetitive harmonic progressions with dense contrapuntal motion to make some of the most exhausting music of all time. And I mean that in the best possible way. After all, he did write the most widely known lullaby in the world. So don't try to tell me he wasn't aware of how sleep-inducing his music was. Anyway, there's a lot of dissonant intervals between the voices in Masuda's counterpoint, which is another feature that makes it sound amateur, although it captures the innocence of preparing for your first gym battle perfectly. 
I definitely see the argument that Masuda's counterpoint is a stylistic choice, but I still hold to the idea that it illustrates a lack of understanding of voice motion and could be altered to achieve more effective cadences. That's why I rewrote the piece, changing many of the dissonant moments to more natural sounding ones. Welcome to the first segment of the show, Counterpoints. I marked the edited notes in red so that you could see what I did. Take a listen. And that's all for today. This has been Poke Tunes. Tune in next time when we talk about Cerulean City and good evening. <laughs>